So today I'm going to be telling you a little bit of what my lab does. Um, we focus a lot on um, diseases of RNA. And uh, within those, we focus a lot on telomerase diseases. Um, and I'll tell you how a telomerase disease is actually an RNA disease. Um, and it really all starts with um, the study of, of rare genetic diseases uh, and how they allow us uh, to decipher uh, molecular regulators of tissue development and of tissue failure. Um, I'm going to tell you two stories today. Um, some of this has been recently published, some of this is unpublished uh, and we're uh, about to submit. Um, the first story is about how the post-transcriptional modification of the RNA component of telomerase uh, regulates uh, hematopoietic development. And there's two components to this one. We're going to focus first on the adenylation of the three prime end of the telomerase RNA component, which is called HTR. And then uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about data that we have on the capping that happens on the five prime end um, of HTR. And then on the second half um, of, of my talk, I'm going to tell you how we have uh, recently discovered that USB1 uh, is a novel microRNA deadenylase that controls microRNA decay, and it's absolutely essential um, for blood development. So I'm pretty sh sure that um, you guys all know telomeres, uh, these repetitive uh, DNA uh, regions that cap um, chromosomal ends. Telomeres in, in humans are uh, 10 to 14 kb. And while these are small regions uh, of our genome, um, they are actually capped by gigantic uh, protein complexes. Um, the first one is called Sheltrin. Uh, and Sheltrin is composed of proteins that bind both to the double-stranded region of the telomere and to the single-stranded 3 prime end overhang of the telomere. And in recent years, we have found that Sheltrin has many um, accessory factors, including another pretty big uh, protein complex called the CST complex. And together, they work uh, to hide uh, the, the telomere from being recognized as a DNA double-stranded break which is an extremely toxic lesion. So the telomere is not recognized as a break because Sheltrin caps it um, and prevents that from happening. Another gigantic protein complex that binds uh, to telomeres is actually telomerase. So telomerase is a uh, reverse transcriptase. Its major components are TERT. So TERT is this pretty big protein here um, that it's the telomerase reverse transcriptase itself. And HTR is the RNA component of telomerase. So telomerase is a ribonucleoprotein. And binding HTR, we have this protein complex here. Uh, so this is HTR, sorry. So this is HTR. It's a 451 nucleotides um, RNA molecule. So it's right at the border between a long non-coding RNA uh, and a small RNA. Uh, it has this three prime end HACA domain, and this is where this other protein complex called the discrin uh, complex binds. Um, the discrin complex is another pretty gigantic protein complex. And over the last five years of, or so, um, our lab and a couple other labs have found different um, and novel uh, accessory factors for the discrin complex in regulating uh, HTR stability. So, Something that is really interesting is that although this is a really small RNA, and we're talking about some pretty big protein complexes here, when we look at patients, we see that most of them have mutations that actually affect the levels of this HTR molecule. So here in this table are all the genes uh, that have been found mutated in these patients. And in red are genes that have a, a function in maintaining HTR levels in cells. And so as you can see, most of them are actually um, responsible for that in these patients. So that's why over the last uh, few years, uh, my lab and, and, and a couple other labs have actually been suggesting that 
these telomere biology disorders are actually ribonucleoprotein hypoassembly uh, syndromes. So in the normal situation, we have the assembly of the RNA, um, of the RNA, oh, sorry, of the ribonucleoprotein outcompeting the decay of the RNA. So this is the major pathway uh, in most of us. In these patients, what happens is that the RNA component of the ribonucleoprotein gets decayed much faster than the assembly of the ribonucleoprotein. So the ribonucleoprotein cannot properly assemble. And what happens when this is uh, happening in telomerase? So most of us will have telomere lengths that are within the purple and the blue line here. And telomeres get shorter as we age, as you have probably heard. What happens with these patients is at a completely different scale. And they have telomeres that are extremely short, below the first percentile. And this leads to some pretty severe phenotypes and the classic uh, telomere biology uh, syndrome is called dyskeratosis congenita. These kids usually come to clinical attention uh, with abnormal skin pigmentation, oroleukoplakia, and neodystrophy. However, the major cause of death in these patients um, really is bone marrow failure. Uh, so telomere shortening pretty quickly uh, causes a completely aplastic marrow and uh, this is a very toxic condition. And unfortunately, it is a condition that remains without a cure. So the, the best chance that these patients have so far is hematopoietic stem cell transplant. However, it is very hard to find compatible don donors for these patients, and they have a very strong immune response that usually leads to a, a poor um, success rate uh, for these patients. So um, more research needs to be done uh, to try to to understand how we can uh, improve uh, their quality of life. There's a lot of research done with telomerase in many different models, starting in Tetrahymena, which is of course, we've got Elizabeth Blackburn and, and Carol Greider, their uh, Nobel Prize uh, on telomerase, all the way to mice. All of these uh, have told us a lot about how telomerase works, but not exactly uh, helpful on how dyskeratosis congenita progresses. So when I started my own lab, I thought it would be a good idea to create a new model of study. Um, and that's when we start having the idea of using the targeted differentiation of human embryonic stem cells into different tissues that are relevant for this disease to try to understand how this disease develops and to try to understand if there are um, points during development that we can um, that, that we can manipulate and maybe reverse uh, tissue development. To do this, uh, so I started my lab in 2014, as I mentioned to, to Giuliano, um, and this was more or less uh, the time that uh, CRISPR technology was becoming pretty uh, available. So we decided in the beginning of my lab to create a huge panel of isogenic human embryonic stem cells. I'm not gonna show you all of them, but for instance, we created this one here, which is a discurrent A353V mutation. And this is a very common mutation in dyskeratosis congenita patients. And um, so we CRISPR this mutation in, it's completely isogenic, there is no selection. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a telomerase activity gel. So this is a wild type and each band in, that you see here in this gel corresponds to the addition of one telomeric repeat. So um, 58, 64, 70 nucleotides. And as you can see here, the discrete mutant has much lower activity than the wild type um, counterparts. And this leads to progressive telomere shortening, as you can see here. So this is the wild type that we CRISPRed. And then this is, uh, so this is a southern blot against telomeres. This is the discrete mutant on passage eight. And then this is the discrete mutant on passage 30. And you can see here that this leads to a pretty significant telomere shortening over time. So we thought that this would be actually a pretty good model to study dyskeratosis congenita. Now, as I mentioned, this is a disease of the blood, of the bone marrow. So to use these cells for that, we would have to have the ability to generate um, blood cells from human embryonic stem cells. 
And um, I was pretty lucky that together with me, uh, Wash U here in St. Louis hired uh, Chris Sturgeon, who had just finished his um, postdoc with Gordon Keller. And his postdoc was all about generating uh, human or recreating human hematopoietic development in vitro. So we can start from a human embryonic stem cell on day zero and uh, through a series of manipulations on these cells uh, on day 30, we can isolate erythroid, myeloid, and also T, uh, T cells. I'm not going to talk much about how this protocol works, but I'm just going to show you here that we start with markers that are classic for embryonic stem cells, such as OCT4 and NINOG. And after 30 days, those markers are completely shut down and then we have uh, expression of hematopoietic markers, such as RENX1, as you can see here. And what was really cool is that we saw that this model indeed uh, would be extremely helpful to study uh, this kratosis congenita. And you can see here, in early passage, our mutants, uh, the discrete mutants, and also another telomerase mutant, they generate both erythroid and myeloid cells to the same efficiency as wild-type cells because they still have long telomeres. However, as telomeres shorten here in late passage, you can see that our discrete mutant and our third mutant compared to their isogenic wild-type counterparts generate pretty much uh, zero uh, hematopoietic cells. So we use this system a lot uh, during the initial years of my lab, and we used it um, to understand pathways that regulate um, telomerase decay. And my lab, together with some other labs, we actually found this system here where we realized that the three prime end of the telomerase RNA component is polyadenylated by this enzyme called PEPD5, and that this polyadenylation of HTR actually targeted for degradation by the exosome. Um, and working on the, on the other hand, PARN is an enzyme that deadenylates um, the tree prime end and protects it from the exosome. So when we, when we realized that this was the case, that tree prime end adenylation of HTR was necessary for its decay, we started to imagine that maybe if we regulate this adenylation, we can actually regulate the decay of HTR in, in patient cells. And that's exactly what we did. So what we did is we silenced uh, PEPD5 in our mutant cells. And you can see here, so this is the mutant in late passage, generating very little erythroid and myeloid um, progenitors. When we silence either the exosome, which decays the RNA itself, or when we silence PEPD5, we have a tremendously significant rescue of hematopoietic development. So these cells now are able to do blood again, despite their mutation into telomerase. So this was true for erythroid in red and myeloid lineages, and is also true for T cells. As you can see here, the mutants have almost no cellularity uh, in their ability of generating T cells. When we silence PEPD5, you can see that we completely rescue this ability uh, of these cells to generate blood. So bone marrow failure is a disease where both, or, or, where all three lineages uh, are compromised, erythroid, myeloid, and, and T cells. And you can see here that we are able to rescue them all just by silencing this enzyme. So in a series of different papers, we proposed that indeed, silencing PEPD5 could be a very um, attractive approach uh, for these patients. And this is something that together with uh, Roy Parker and a couple different um, pharma companies, we're trying to develop um, better and more efficient uh, regulators of, of, of inhibitors of PEPD5 to maybe try to bring this um, uh, to clinical trials um, in the near future. So this is something that we started the lab with and we're still working on, um, but most of the data that I presented right now, uh, we have uh, published. But one thing that was always uh, on our minds is that uh, 
whenever we inhibited PEP D5 and we completely prevented uh, the adenylation of the three prime end of HTR, even if we did that, we still had lower HTR levels in our discurrent mutants, as you can see here, in our and in our parent mutants as well. So these are cells where we treated either with DMSO as a control in black or with a chemical inhibitor of PEPT5 uh, called RG7834. And uh, what I'm showing you here is relative HTR expression. And in red, uh, we did uh, three prime end sequencing of HTR just to see how long the A tail was. And you can see when we treat with RG7834, we do not capture any uh, A-tail extension. So there's no adenylation in these HTR molecules. However, it's pretty clear that the amount of expression of HTR is still much lower than it is in the, in the wall-type cells. And when we quantify the decay rates, even in the presence of this inhibitor of RG7834, you can see here that when compared to wall-type, Although RG7834 slows down the decay of HTR in our mutants, it still does not bring it anywhere near the wild type levels. So this, of course, indicated to us that there must be additional HTR decay mechanisms that affect uh, stability in telomerase mutants. And uh, at the same time that um, we were getting these data, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Grazia Daniela Rafa, who then um, came to do a sabbatical here in my lab, she was studying the other end of HTR. She was studying the five prime end of HTR. And she realized that there is this enzyme called TGS1 that puts a TMG cap on the five prime end of HTR. And if she inhibits uh, TGS1, this TMG cap would not get formed, so it would remain an MMG cap, and this would lead to increased HTR levels and telomerase activity. So she saw diminished HTR trimethylation, she saw higher HTR levels, higher telomerase activity. So we, of course, wonder if this could explain our data. We were wondering how does this correlate with our three prime end uh, data? What are the pathways of decay? being activated here? And could this be relevant for the sclerotosis congenita? So as I mentioned, uh, Grazia came to my lab to do a sabbatical, and we started to work on this. And uh, the first thing we did was just to genetically inhibit TGS1 in our discrete mutants. And we were pretty happy to see that indeed it increases telomerase, uh, sorry, increases HTR levels, as you can see here in green. And we were very happy to see that when we inhibit TGS1, we also have an increase in telomerase activity. So you have to compare these bands here with these bands here. So clearly, when we inhibit TGS1, we have an increase in telomerase activity in our mutant cells. So the next question we asked was, okay, so what happens if we combine the inhibition of TGS1 and pap 5 Could this be beneficial? Is this acting to the same pathway of decay or not? So we started to do those experiments, and this is a northern blot um, where I'm showing you here HTR, and I'll talk about why there's two bands later. Um, those, both of these bands are HTR, actually, so this is mature HTR, and this is a precursor form. You can see that the mutant has very little HTR because, again, gets decayed pretty quickly. If we inhibit TGS1, we have some upregulation of TGS of, of HTR. If we inhibit um, PEP-D5, we have some upregulation of, of HTR. And then, uh, pretty strikingly, if we inhibit both, we have a complete rescue of HTR levels in our discretosis congenital mutant cells. So this happened uh, when we silenced these genes genetically, and it happened with chemical inhibition as well, uh, inhibiting TGS1 with sinefungin, in inhibiting pep 5 with RG7834, Combining treatments, you can see that we have a pretty significant rescue of HTR levels. When we quantify by um, real-time PCR, 
this is the mutant, this is the wild type, and then this is the mutant when we inhibit both. And for the first time, we actually were able to bring HTR levels in these mutants, not only back to wild type, but sometimes even higher to wild type levels. So clearly, the combined inhibition of 5' prime cap hypermethylation and 3' prime end deadenylation causes a synergistic effect in HTR levels. Uh, is this because of reduced decay uh, rates of this RNA? Uh, and we believe it is. So this is, again, uh, we were measuring the half-life of HTR, and we did that through actinomycin D uh, experiments, uh, actinomycin D release. So this is the decay rate for the mutant, as you can see here in blue. And then in black is the wild type, and in yellow is combined treatments. So we now have a decay rate in these mutants, despite them not having this current. These HTR molecules are able to last as long as they last in wild type cells. It would be important to know if these HTR molecules remain uh, functional, right? Because they are pretty modified. Are they still able to be loaded onto telomerase and to extend telomeres? So we did telomerase activity assays for that. And uh, the result was pretty striking. Uh, again, uh, this is the mutant here. These two lanes, you can see very little telomerase activity. This is the combo treatment where we inhibited TGS1 and PEPT5. And you can see that we bring telomerase activity back to what we see in wild type levels. So clearly, uh, it, it worked. Um, so when we saw this, we thought, OK, so probably what is happening here um, is that TGS1 is, is TGS1 silencing is helping with the deadenylation of the three prime end of, of HTR, right? That would be the only thing that that was the most immediate thought that would it would be helping PEPT5 um, to not uh, add those those eight tails. However, our three prime end sequencing actually showed something opposite. So what we started to see is that whenever we treated cells with TGS1 inhibitors, we actually saw an increase in ATALs in our HTR molecule. So how is this possible, right? Because we know that ATALs cause decay. So for that, we had to go back to how HTR is processed in human cells. As I mentioned in the beginning, this molecule has 451 nucleotides in its mature form. When it's immediately transcribed, HTR actually is much longer. It has up to 1,000 nucleotides. And then different 3 to 5 prime exonucleases that we're still trying to identify, actually, they chop this down to 451. And 451 is really the optimal size to be loaded onto telomerase. So these precursors, these longer precursors, are not really loaded onto telomerase. But if they are chopped down, then they can be loaded. And what our 3' end sequencing showed is that whenever we inhibit um, TGS1, which again acts on the 5' prime end of this molecule, we actually have an increase in the percentage of these extended uh, precursors of HTR. You can see here in blue, in the, in the um, DMSO treated, and, in, and down here in the sinofungin treated, the extended molecules. So we have a significant increase on the amount of molecules, of, ter of HTR molecules, that are 3' end extended. And the reason here that we skip uh, one nucleotide from one to three is that position 452 is also is actually an A, so that could be confused with an A tail, so we don't quantify that one. So how can this be happening, right? So how can something that modulates five prime capping be regulating three prime end processing? Uh, we decided to to study this in, in more detail. So the first thing we started to do was uh, doing an IP of three methylated capped um, HTR. And we would probe 
for different HTR models. So Amplicon A is mature Turk, as you can see here, and the probe is only on the mature region. Amplicon B gets uh, mature and immature. Amplicon C is only uh, immature, pre-extended. And then Amplicon D is very, very early on in the processing. It's almost 1,000 nucleotides. So this is very immature HTR molecules. And what we saw is that already Amplicon D, which is the immediate uh, transcript of HTR, is already TMG kept. So TGS1 acts very early on in the scapping uh, stages. What does this mean? What we actually saw is that the prevention of this TMG cap formation prevents the decay of these longer HCR precursors. So here, we're quantifying the different precursors, B, C, and D. And you can see that even D, which is very immature, when we treat either with the inhibitor of TGS1 or both, we have a significant increase in the amount of these molecules within the cell. When we do a, a more specific sequencing, we see that all of these precursors are now 3' and adenylated. So they are not being decayed, but they are adenylated. Pepti5 is acting on them. So how come they are not being decayed? And what we realize that happens is that these precursors are actually being translocated to the cytoplasm. So they go from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, where they are now protected from uh, decay by the exosome. And somehow, what happens is that these um, precursors find a way back into cahal bodies uh, within the nucleus. So there's a nuclear reimport, and this is what we're trying to understand now: is uh, which enzymes are responsible to bring these HTR precursors back into the nucleus, uh, where they are then processed into telomerase. But we do believe that we have found not only a, a chemical way uh, to rescue HTR levels in this fertosis congenital mutants, but we have found a novel pathway of decay um, of, of HTR that is completely dependent on what's happening on both its ends at the same time. Um, so this is something that we are submitting for publication, hopefully this next month. Uh, let's see how it goes. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I can keep, I have a second part of the talk now, but I can answer questions now. I, I'm going to change subjects a little bit. Um, Maybe I, don't know, Leon, if you leave for the, I think we can leave for, for the end. Uh, for the end, okay. Please. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the, the major areas of my lab. Another area that we work uh, is this gene called USB1. And we started working uh, on this gene uh, because this first table that I showed you here, uh, mutations found in DC, was actually missing, um, was actually missing a gene. And it's this gene called USB1. So mutations in USB1 they cause uh, DC-like phenotypes. So these patients, they come to clinical attention at a similar age, very, very uh, early on during their childhood and with very similar phenotypes. Um, USB1 stands for U6 biogenesis 1. Uh, it was known to be a 3 to 5 prime uh, exoribonuclease, and it was involved in the maturation of U6 snow RNA by removing removing terminal use. Um, and by doing so, it was known that it protected U6 uh, snow RNA from being degraded by the RNA decay machinery. U6, in turn, was the only described target of USB1. And U6 is a core um, component of the spliceosome. So, the question was, how do USB1 mutations cause disease? Uh, and, and my colleague, Klaus Azalin, he was the first one that started working with USB1 mutants in East. And in East, uh, he very elegantly showed that U6 really is the only target of USB1. He showed that USB1 mutants have lower levels of U6. They indeed have 
pre-mRNA splicing defect, so they have splicing defects. And in yeast, uh, he showed that this leads to impaired HTR processing and, and reduced telomerase activity. A few years later, uh, Noik and Moshi's group, uh, now working with zebrafish and using uh, morpholinos, he showed that these fish um, had developmental defects. He showed neutropenia in these fish, uh, which is something that uh, phenocopies the patients a little bit. He showed splicing defects in neutrophil-related genes. However, no telomerase and no telomere defects at all were observed in this fish. And fast forward another um, few years, and again, uh, Klaus Azaline and also Inderje Dokal from London, now finally working with the patient cells with the exact point mutations that they have, they actually show that these patients do not have reduced U6 levels. They have normal U6 levels, but these U6 molecules have longer poly U tails. However, no splicing defects at all. So as you can see here, this is a northern blot for U6. The levels are the same. It runs longer in the gel because it's, it has more use and it's three, it's three prime and tail. When we look at splicing, it's exactly the same as well type. So the curves, you cannot even see, but the curves just follow each other um, identically, the well type and the mutants. And also no reduced telomeres activity and no telomere shortening. Um, so because of no telomere shortening, these patients are actually now classified as a different uh, yeah. disease. Uh, USV1 mutation patients are classified as poikiloderma with neutropenia. Uh, these patients also have severe bone marrow failure and very severe neutropenia. So they usually start with neutropenia uh, and they have a very high uh, predisposition to MDS and to AML. However, Despite we knowing a lot about USP1 in terms of its role in U6 biology, we have absolutely no idea how these patients were getting sick. Could it be that in human cells, uh, USP1 has additional targets? Are splicing defects may be responsible for this disease, but at different stages of development? And can we find therapeutic strategies for these patients? So it was clear that we needed uh, a new model of study. So again, uh, we did uh, what we usually do. We created human embryonic stem cells harboring very common mutations found in these patients. Uh, this was actually a very difficult uh, locus to target, um, but my postdoc, uh, Ho Cheng um, Zhang, who now started his own lab in Korea, um, he put a lot of work into this. Um, the cells were finally done after almost one year it took him. He was excited to start experiments. And then a uh, huge bummer, these cells have absolutely no phenotype. They were absolutely normal. Sorry. Uh, they're absolutely normal. So they had normal pluripotency. They had normal cell cycle, normal proliferation. And uh, pretty disappointing to me, Indeed, they had absolutely no telomere defects at all in their embryonic state. As you can see here, telomeres remain pretty long through passaging in these cells. Uh, Ho Cheng did not get discouraged. He thought that maybe uh, defects would happen at specific tissues or specific developmental stages. So he was very optimist about this. So he started doing hematopoietic development since these patients die of bone marrow failure. And again, huge bummer. Up to day 16, we see absolutely no phenotype. These cells develop normally. So day 16 is a day that the discretosis congenita cells already, already start to show uh, enormous phenotypes. The USB1 cells do not. Again, Ho Cheng did not get discouraged. He kept on sorting and, and growing these cells. And I'm very happy he did so because indeed, when we analyzed mature cells for the first time, we saw that we could phenocopy um, the patient's phenotype and these USB1 mutants have a pretty severe uh, reduction in their hematopoietic output. And it actually makes sense that it takes so long for us to see phenotypes because when we start looking at the expression of USB1 during this differentiation protocol, 
we see that USB-1 really starts only to get expressed um, in later stages of development. So this actually started to make a lot of sense. Is the mutation really what's causing um, these phenotypes? So to check for that, what Ho Cheng did was to put wild type USB-1 USB back into our USB-1 mutant cells. Uh, we use a safe harbor locus for that in a conditional manner. So only when we treat with docs, USB-1, wild type USB-1, as you can see here, gets expressed. And we were very happy to see that indeed, when we put uh, USB-1 back, we have a rescue of the hematopoietic deficit in these patients. Um, so, so far, I showed you that USB-1 causes no phenotypes in embryonic stem cells, uh, no phenotypes during early stages of hematopoiesis, but severe impairments during late stages. Um, can we use our system to find the molecular mechanisms for this? So that's what we tried next. Um, and of course, the first thing we tried was, let's look at U6 and let's look at splicing. Um, and when we did so, just like what Klaus had shown, we do we have normal levels of U6 and of the minor form of U6 called U6 ATAC. It, lo it runs longer in a gel just because it has longer U tails. Um, and now we could actually do something that Klaus at the time could not do. We could do the three prime end sequencing. And it's very clear uh, this increase here in the gel. You can see it here by sequencing. Uh, we have additional use uh, on the three prime end tails of our USB-1 mutants in light blue. However, these longer U-tailed U6 molecules do not interfere with the spliceosome activity. Uh, what I'm showing you here, it's splicing compared um, the wild type and the mutant on day zero, day 16 of hematopoiesis and day 30. And it's almost a silly graph because it's, it's just a blue dot. But what this means is that actually we could find no differences in splicing between wild type and mutants. So again, a very interesting situation where we have patients that die very early on with very severe phenotypes. We see similar phenotypes in vitro with low blood levels, but we do not have a mechanism, right? Nothing that we see is different. So, you know, we did what people do when we have no idea about how to move forward, that uh, we sequenced. So we sequenced, we did a complete mRNA sequencing where we found no difference. I'm not even showing you that here. But we also did a microRNA sequencing, and that's when things started to get really interesting because we started to see pretty significant differences in microRNA levels only in hematopoietic stem cells, CD34, CD45 positive cells. And what Ho Cheng did was to overlay the microRNAs that we saw were reduced uh, in our mutants with microRNAs that we knew were important for hematopoietic development. And he came up with this list of four different microRNAs, 125, 142, 199, and 223. He confirmed that these microRNAs were reduced um, in our USB-1 mutants. And he confirmed that if we put USB-1 back into these cells, we rescue the expression of these microRNAs. So for the first time, we had found novel targets of USB-1 in human cells. Uh, through these four different microRNAs here. Are they causing disease? So we decided to check for that. So the first thing we did was we overexpressed these four microRNAs in our mutant cells. And we go from this level of expression to this. And it was pretty clear that when we try to do blood, we go from this amount of erythroid and myeloid to a complete rescue in the mutants expressing these four microRNAs. So that checked very well. Then we tried to do the opposite approach and we inhibited these four microRNAs uh, using antagomeres. We inhibited these four microRNAs in wild type cells and we saw the opposite phenotype. So whenever we inhibit these microRNAs, we have a significant reduction of hematopoiesis uh, in our wild type cells. So indeed, it seems that we have found the molecular cause of um, 
poikilodermal neutropenia, which is reduced levels of specific microRNAs. However, there's still another question, uh, which is uh, how is USB1 uh, regulating uh, microRNA levels? And this is something that we currently have ongoing in the lab, um, and, and we have um, actually positions for postdocs to work on this if anyone is interested. And uh, some things that, one thing that we started to realize is that these microRNAs are actually getting decayed very, very fast uh, in our um, USB1 mutants. So they decay extremely prematurely compared to all type cells. And what we also noticed is that all of these microRNAs that seem to be regulated by USB1, they have an increase in A tails on their three prime end tails. Uh, and sorry, so as you can see here, 125, uh, 142, 199, and 223. They all have an increased A tail. So we started to wonder if maybe USB1 is actually a specific microRNA deadenylase, and it's able to deadenylate microRNAs. So together with our uh, longtime collaborator, Roy Parker, at uh, Colorado, uh, we decided to do an in vitro microRNA deadenylase assay. And what we did is we had different microRNAs. Uh, here I'm showing you 125, where we had either the native form or we had the native form where we, we would put different ends, either A's or U's or a mix of A's and U's or U's and A's. We would purify and do this all in vitro, so there was nothing else uh, in, in this reaction tube. It was just a microRNA and purified USB1. And as it's pretty clear from these images, while we have absolutely no activity on the mutant USB1, whenever we have wild-type USB1, whenever there's an ending that it's um, an A, we can see significant deadenylation of this microRNA. And this happens extremely fast, as you can see here already in uh, 15 minutes. And it's pretty specific uh, for eight tails. Um, uh, reviewers asked us to do this in many different types of uh, RNA uh, substrates. So here, just showing you that a very small RNA substrate, uh, only seven nucleotides, uh, if I'm not wrong, plus then the tail. And you can see that whenever it finishes in A's, we have significant deadenylation with wild type USB1, no deadenylation at all with the mutants found uh, in patients. Um, it's very interesting and something that we're still trying to understand. USB1 is able to remove one U uh, out of RNA tails, and then it stops. If you put another A, then it keeps going. Um, so one U at a time, but has many A's as there are. Um, so because we found that USB1 is a novel microRNA deadenylase, uh, we thought that maybe if we inhibit whatever adenylates these microRNAs, we could have um, a similar effect. So again, we inhibited PEPT5, and we knew that PEPT5 uh, adenylates microRNAs. Um, we were able to silence PEPT5 quite well, in these cells. And indeed, we saw in our USB1 mutants, if we inhibit PEPT5, we have tremendous rescue of the expression of these microRNAs showing you here. And what's really cool, I'm running out of time here, so just skipping over this. What's really cool is that if we inhibit PEPT5 using this chemical, the small molecule that we tested before, RG7834, we are also able to rescue hematopoiesis uh, in these patients. So um, a lot of what I just mentioned to you, not the decay data, but a, a lot of it has recently been published by, uh, by Ho Cheng. And as I mentioned, Ho Cheng just started his lab in, in, in Korea. Um, we keep working um, on this on USB1, of course, and uh, we are really interested on, on discovering how different deadenylases select our targets. Um, there are more microRNA deadenylases in the cell. It's not only USB1. Why don't they simply step in and do the job that USB1 is not doing in those patients? Something that we still don't understand. 
how are these micronase getting decayed? Why is neutropenia the first phenotype observed in these patients? Uh, and what are the specific targets of these microRNAs in the blood? Um, just uh, some brief uh, data. Um, we think that the other microRNAs that we know are not kicking in for USB1 simply because they are not expressed in blood. So this is expression in different tissues for USB1, PARN, and TO1. And when we look at blood, which is the last one here, you can see that USB1 is expressed at much higher levels than the other microRNA the adenylases. So that's from, that's that could be a, a reason of why um, these other micro the microRNA the adenylases do not step in. Um, and it's pretty cool that we can recapitulate this expression pattern in our in vitro system uh, when we look at USB1 expression during differentiation. We see a huge increase at the end, and we do not see that increase in PARN and TO1. Um, we can actually see the effect of USB1 in the blood is so uh, potent that if we do a whole blood 3 prime end sequencing, we can actually capture um, increased adenylation in, in our mutants uh, in their entire blood system. So not only the targets of USB1, but everything. Uh, the, 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 the effect is so potent that we can capture that by uh, whole genome sequencing. Um, and we believe that this is being decayed, these molecules are being decayed by the exosome. If we inhibit the exosome, we're actually able to rescue uh, hematopoiesis and uh, PN mutants. And final slide here, sorry. Um, we're doing more efforts to understand when in the microRNA um, processing pathway this happens. And we, we now know that actually USB1 only acts in guide and not in passenger uh, microRNA strands. So they have to be loaded onto Argonaut for uh, USB1 to be active. And um, with that, I'm just going to end. Um, I'd like really to thank a lot my collaborators, uh, Roy Parker uh, at uh, Boulder, Grazia, as I mentioned, um, she has her own lab at Sapienza. She did a sabbatical here with us. Um, and our sequencing, uh, we have tremendous help from Albert I. at Tufts. Um, most of this work uh, was done by um, Ho Cheng and Wilson. Ho Cheng is now starting, as I mentioned, his lab in Korea. Uh, and also thank a lot uh, the other members of my lab and, of course, my funding. So thank you very much.